Now let's go to part two of the Mexican independence presentation. And let's appreciate something <clears throat> uh, now in the second part, we're going to get actually into the independence. So, you know, one of the things that's important, we're going to get into the 19th century, 19th century Mexican history. Um, when we look at the 19th century history of Mexico, I mean, it is one that's filled with violence. <clears throat> Mexico and, and Mexicans <clears throat> are not going to know peace between 1810 to 1920 and this 110 year period. Uh, we just count the events. I mean, just take a look at the events and understand the violence that's under that, that is under uh, uh, underlying all of these events. One is, of course, Mexican independence. And that's going to be a 15-year struggle just to create an independent nation. The other, of course, is going to be the question of the Alamo, and um, and and then and then eventually that's going to lead to the Texas question, which eventually is going to lead to the annexation of Texas by the United States which eventually is going to lead to the U.S. war with Mexico. And then after the U.S. war with Mexico, when Mexico loses half its territory, here comes the French to come to occupy Mexico. So there's the French occupation. And then there's the movement to oust the French, which is going to take a period of four to five years. And then uh, eventually after the French, with the death of Benito Juarez, going, is going to be the rise of a dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, who's going to rapidly modernize Mexican society at tremendous human cost. Then it's, it's going to be known as the Porfiriato, which is going to lead to the Mexican Revolution, which eventually is going to result in, in, in millions and millions of deaths in Mexico. So <clears throat> for over 100 years, Mexico and Mexicans are going to experience calamities, uh, setbacks, intense struggles, and most importantly, tremendous territorial loss. So Mexican history is incredibly amazing, given the adversity. And every Mexican must understand this 19th century history. The 19th century history of Mexico is very important for any Mexican living in the 21st century. This is our inheritance. It, it behooves every Mexican, every Chicano, to understand what happened in this 19th century history. Every struggle in the Mexican past reveals the dance of good against evil, of anti-democratic forces pitted against progressive reform, of the eagle devouring the snake perched on a cactus, classic national symbol. So where do we begin this journey uh, on, in, in terms of the independence? Well, we begin it with one particular man. His name is Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla. Here he is, a criollo. This particular man will provide the initial spark for independence. Now remember, the spark for independence comes from Europe because in 1808, Napoleon is going to invade Spain and install his brother, Joseph, as king, setting off a chain of events that would lead to the breakup of the entire Spanish colonial empire. But it is Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla that is important here. And why? Because he's a Jesuit priest. And uh, he was always involved in economic democracy for his parishioners in Dolores. And most importantly, as, as a priest, he recognized the significance of the Virgen de Guadalupe uh, to the native majority, even though <clears throat> the criollo consciousness is eventually going to usurp this symbol for themselves. This symbol is a native symbol. This woman, the Virgen de Guadalupe, is a native woman. She is not a European woman. The Catholic Church is going to take over 300 years just to finally acknowledge that perhaps there might be the Virgen de Guadalupe. And then, of course, just recently, they beatified the person who introduced uh, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe. They beatified him as a saint. So <clears throat> the Virgen de Guadalupe to the native peoples has always been a sacred woman. She is the one that, that, that allows native peoples by which to accept the faith of Christianity. And you have to recognize that Christianity is rooted in native traditions, especially with regards to living uh, in a humble, uh, a humble experience. Um, uh, the, so the Virgen, the Virgen is that uh, uh, 
syncretism, the syncretic uh, 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 adaptation of uh, a, a syncretism of native beliefs along with European traditions. So, so here we have the Virgen de Guadalupe, a native woman. Right. So Miguel Hidalgo is going to use her as a symbol of economic and social justice. And that's what the Virgen is going to eventually become, the symbol of economic and social justice. The Virgen de Guadalupe to the native majority. And he will rec and understand that very significantly. He's going to organize a literary club uh, to plot the separation from Spain. On December 8th, it was set, the, that was the date that was set for the uprising, December 8th, because that's the time that native peoples began to get together to celebrate the Virgen de Guadalupe's uh, a major celebration on December 12th. The preparations begin. So he's using December 8th as the setup for the uprising. However, the plot is uncovered. He, his scheme is uncovered because he needs to store arms. He needs arms for the rebellion. And he gets caught cashing arms, cashing arms. So what happens when the plot is uncovered on September 15th, he has to call native peoples together. And so on midnight of September 15th, Right going into September 16th, he's going to ring the church bells of Dolores and he's going to deliver his most famous message, which becomes known as the Grito de Dolores. And in the Grito, he's going to exclaim that that's it, down with the Gachupines. Now what Gachupin is, is Gachupin is a very negative term to identify, um, to identify, um, the Peninsulares. Gachupin means to be kicked. It's a boot, to be booted. Um, uh, Gachupin means that you, you're kicked, you're booted out. And he's relating to the Peninsulares. So, so if you're Mexicano, Mexicana, you have to understand that the Grito de Dolores means you're no longer Hispanic. You are no longer Hispanic. Now you are using your heritage, your Mexica heritage, your native heritage, your native roots, and you're uplifting that instead of being Spanish. So the Hispanic past no longer works here. That's what the Grito de Dolores is. You have to understand the Grito because the Grito is a Native American call for independence. <laughs> okay? So don't be ashamed a, 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 a of the grito because that's the grito that every Mexicano knows, but they don't understand what it means. Well, what it means because they're always drunk and then they, they, they have this feeling. No, that's the grito de Dolores. That's the grito de Dolores. That's the grito that says we are no longer Hispanic. We are Mexica. We are Mexican. And the native peoples, the native peoples take over the rebellion and the criollos. Exactly, this is what, what exactly what the Criollos didn't want because now it becomes a racial uprising. The native peoples take over the rebellion and the native peoples are going to go to the granary in Guanajuato and, and on their way they're going to scorch everything post toasty crisp to the ground that is Spanish. Everything. Everything Spanish. Cattle, horses, chickens, everything Spanish. The churches, the, the chalices, the, everything. The only thing that they'll leave up are native traditions. So this is exactly what the Criollos, who are the ones that have the arms, that, are, that Miguel Hidalgo is trying to convince, but the, the Criollos are going, well, wait a minute, Miguel. I mean, look, look, look what's happening now. The native peoples have taken over, and Miguel is trying to tell them, Miguel Hidalgo is trying to tell them, hey, 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 look at, they're frustrated. That's 300 years of frustration. Let their frustrations out, man. They've been oppressed for so long. And we need them to overthrow the Spanish. Okay? All right. Now, let's leave that and let's move up. All right? And understand the independence movement. Uh, he's going to use the, the banner of the Virgen de Guadalupe. It becomes a, a native uprising. Everything's scorched from post hosting pits to the ground. Now, let's move over to Texas because there's certain things brewing in Texas. And let's take a look at a revolt that happens in Texas 
at about the same time in 1811. All right? uh, in this revolt, it's very important to understand because uh, the United States is going to play a role in it because there's two major rebellions in Texas that took place, one in 1811, one in 1813. So let's take a look at 1811. One of the things about Texas is that the, the people who lived up in Texas, the Tejanos, they maintained Spanish notions of prestige, yet they considered themselves as citizens uh, when they hear of the rebellion in Mexico. Um, the insurgency in Texas, the revolt that occurred in Texas, was largely a family affair. Uh, the proximity to the United States, uh, native resistance is what's going to fuel the rebellion because Texas basically is Comanche territory. Texas is controlled by the Native Americans. Um, the, the, the 1811 rebellion consisted of, of Mexican uh, families who were against the crown because the crown had never extended e efforts up there to protect them against native encroachment and against Americans moving west. The 1813 rebellion brought Anglo-Americans into the picture in Texas. Uh, on January 22nd, 1811, um, this retired army officer that was residing along the Rio Grande River Valley will lead what is known as the Insurgent Army of America. His name was Juan Bautista de las Casas. Um, the mayor of Bejar, uh, his name was Francisco Travieso, and then another uh, uh, soldier named Gaspar Flores. Uh, they will assist uh, Casas in taking over San Antonio. Travesio, uh, who eventually gets caught, will eventually confess that he participated in the revolt to protect the Hanos and to deal with the Comanche, because the Comanche were the ones that constantly, uh, I, I, uh, when you take a look at Native American history, uh, they had effective uh, defensive forces to prevent the usurpation of their lands. So the resistance movement in Texas will link up with a Spanish officer who defected. And his name is Mariano Jimenez, who will lead insurgents from San Luis Potosí, Saltillo and, Salt, excuse me, Saltillo and Monclava. Hidalgo, meanwhile, Hidalgo is going to rely on, on Jimenez's base of support because Hidalgo is going to make a mistake, uh, uh, Miguel Hidalgo. Um, he, he can go in, once he, he takes over the granary in, in, in Guanajuato, he has direct access to Mexico City. But the Native Americans that he's leading don't have arms. And he does not want to see a massacre, even though he knows that they can take over the government and just end the independence movement right away. He wants to protect his charges because he doesn't have arms. So he's waiting to see if the Texas revolt will bring arms to him. And so um, Hidalgo will rely in Texas in his base of support as Hidalgo uh, makes a mistake. And so the colonial forces are able to, to uh, uh, reorganize and then they're going to go after him. And so he's going to flee to the north to regroup. Uh, meanwhile, in Texas, um, De Las Casas is going to make connections to Louisiana for arms and mercenaries. Um, Casas is going to occupy Bejar um, from January 22nd to March 2nd. Juan Jose Zambrano is going to lead a counterinsurgency, and he will defeat the insurgents at a site called the Wells of Bajan in March 21st. Now, there is, curiously, a report by a Lieutenant Miguel Diaz de Luna and, and Governor Salcedo's, Salcedo's appeal reveals the Tejano's disdain for Gachupines. Um, they did not like, the, in, in Texas, in, 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 the, the Tejanos, the, the people who are celebrating their, their identity uh, in, in the new areas, uh, they thought that the military was going to abandon Texas and move to the Rio Grande. Luna and Salcedo are going to influence people to switch sides and their resistance will be uh, absolved. So there is one historian uh, who argues that medieval chivalry associated with elite prestige was what influenced the era. Catholicism, uh, uh, marriage alliances, uh, the compadrasco, and economic patronage were part and parcel of elite families assuming the duties of the state uh, as central Mexico collapsed. 
Um, one historian points to the Seguin family as evidence of prestige. Gaspar Flores, the uncle of Erasmo Seguin, uh, his wife, Maria Josefa Becerra, uh, participated in the rebellion. The Trevisios and the Seguins were very powerful families, and the success and failure of the insurgents were determined by their ability to garner support from the Tejano elites. So the idea was, well, who has the arms? Who can muster up the army? And after the rebellion, uh, what will happen is these families will come back to power in Texas, even though they rebelled against Spain. Okay? So that's the, the Texas revolt. Now let's come back to uh, the center, and let's understand that in the center, um, uh, the, the Hidalgo eventually is going to get caught, um, he's going to be defrocked, and he's going to be decapitated. The Criollos are going to be alarmed at the radical shift of the revolution. Uh, the native, it becomes a native movement for independence. It becomes a mestizo movement for independence. It becomes an African movement for independence. The Criollos favored the elimination of the Peninsulares, but not at the expense of being swept up in a social revolution. So, an Afro-Mexicano, an Afro-Mestizo, José María Morelos y Pavón, he's another parish priest. He becomes the new leader of the revolt once Hidalgo is captured and decapitated. He recognized the Criollos' lack of commitment and he relied on guerrilla warfare to keep the enemy off guard. Um, he's going to write a declaration of independence declaring that those who are opposing the independence are guilty of treason. He's going to influence the writing of a constitution that called for sovereignty in the people. He will write a statement saying that we must have universal male suffrage, that the slavery and the caste system must be abolished, that government monopolies must be replaced by a 5% income tax, and that judicial torture be abolished. So Miguel Hidalgo, I mean, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón's constitution called for sovereignty in the people. Now, he can only uh, resist for so long. He likewise needs arms. He doesn't have it. He's going to be captured in the fall of 1815. He will be defrocked, and he will be executed by a firing squad. The independence movement is going to lose support with his death. Now let's go back to the rebellion in Texas and let's understand uh, with Miguel Hidalgo uh, first being decapitated, there was a rebellion in Texas. Now with Jose Maria Moreros Pavon being captured, there's still a rebellion in Texas. Let's go to that other rebellion in Texas and let's appreciate. Um, in 1813, the insurgency uh, in 1813, is going to be led by uh, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara. The royalist, the, the, the colonial royalist, is going to counterattack. The, the counterattack is going to be stronger and more violent. Um, Jose Ant Antonio Lopez is going to write about the last night of uh, Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara in a great book about uh, uh, him being a Texas hero. Um, the insurgency <clears throat> gains a larger base of support that there's going to be more dead and numerous more forced into hiding. What's going to happen with Gutierrez is, is he's going to escape in 1811 from the 1811 revolt, and he's going to escape to a place on the border between, the, between uh, Louisiana and Texas um, known as Nacodoches. And there he will enlist uh, native support, and he will get support from uh, the Alabama Cushata native peoples. In January 1812, he's going to travel to Washington, D.C., and he's going to go through Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, James Monroe will support him, but Secretary of State apparently tells him, we will support you as long as the Rio Grande becomes the United States' western border. Um, he defies that, and so the United States is going to be sending mercenaries, and is going to be sending groups of people to go and lay claim of Texas for the United States. Um, uh, Bernardo um, Gutierrez de Lara will also meet with Cuban exiles, uh, who are also attempting to uh, provide uh, impetus for independence in Cuba. 
Gutierrez is going to come back into Texas with Anglo mercenaries, um, and they will form the Republican Army of the North. They will have arms, and by August 12th, they will first occupy Nagotoches. Uh, and on November 7th, uh, La Bajia Presidio is going to be surrendered. Uh, a governor Salcedo and Lieutenant Herrera that form part of the colonialist army will battle with the army at La Bajia. However, royal desertions will hasten Salcedo and Herrera's retreat. And as they advance to Bejar, which is near San Antonio, Salcedo will attempt to halt them at the Battle of Salado River. On April 1st, 1813, Gutierrez will issue terms of surrender, uh, declare Texas's independence as part of Mexico. The Anglo-Americans will not like this. Uh, the occupation will last until August of 1813, and then eventually colonial forces under the leadership of General Arredondo will rout Gutierrez at Medina River. And so those are the two rebellions that will occur in Texas over uh, the revolt uh, between 1813 to 1821. Uh, um, the insurgents will be routed. Um, they'll follow a policy of what will be known as no quarter. Uh, the young uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana will be part of the regiment, the colonial regiment, that will force that. And between 1831 to 1821, Texas has to rebuild in controversy over this rebellion. Okay, so let's return now uh, to uh, the central Mexico. Uh, there were two storms brewing in Texas, one in 1811 and one in 1813. And primarily what's, what's happening is, is that... Um, is that uh, in Texas, since it's Comanche territory, um, the peoples uh, are, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the Spanish colonists are at arms with central Mexico because they're not protecting them against the Native Americans. And that's what their discontent is, and that's why they want their own uh, autonomy by which to deal with, they're just frustrated with central Mexico and not paying attention to their colony up in the north. Um, so when we come back to central Mexico, uh, there is uh, guerrilla warfare that continues under the leadership of two men known as Guadalupe Victoria and Vicente Guerrero. Guadalupe Victoria is the picture up at the top. Um, that is his portrait on the left-hand side at the top. And then there is Vicente Guerrero. Uh, he is a, a revolutionary leader from uh, Veracruz. Um, he is important because he is the strongest in terms of guerrilla warfare because he has what is known as El Ejército Moreno, which is the dark army. He has the black army. His army consists of Afro-Mestizos and Negros, and they cannot be defeated, and he controls the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is a very important Isthmus of Oaxaca, uh, uh, and, and Veracruz. It controls the trade routes uh, between the Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, so he has sufficient resources by which to maintain resistance uh, against uh, a leader who's going to take over the uh, um, uh, Peninsulares uh, uh, against the crown, against uh, uh, who's going to fight for the crown against Hidalgo, against everyone else. His name is Agustin de Iturbide. You see him on the bottom picture, the, uh, uh, um, on the left-hand side of the bottom picture, and then eventually his coronation on the right-hand side, the bottom picture. As a lieutenant, he was a criollo who fought for the crown against Hidalgo. However, Agustin de Iturbide uh, could not defeat Guerrero. He's going to ask for peace, and in this peace process, um, Will, be, will, will occur um, um, uh, the, the Plana de, Ali, de Iguala. But let me share with you first uh, this plan, um, the Plan de Iguala, which is the one that's going to uh, finally end uh, the, the revolution. Um, what is important to appreciate about this, um, uh, the Plan de Iguala, uh, is that uh, the guerrilla warfare will continue uh, Agustin Iturbide, the reason why the Plan de Iguala is going to come about is because Ferdinand VII uh, is finally going to be able to oust um, uh, Napoleon's brother from Spain 
Uh, he's going to restore the crown. And what's going to happen by, in, restora in, the, in the restoration is that Ferdinand VII is going to realize that he needs to give people their rights. And so he orders in the colonies to begin to give criollos uh, their rights um, in, in the colonies and to begin to allow for greater participation in the political process. So he begins to chip away at Gachupin, uh, at, at the Peninsulares power. Well, this prompts uh, 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 Agustin de Iturbide to say, well, wait a minute, here we are. We've been fighting for Gachupin power, and now he's curtailing our power through these, uh, through these reforms in the Constitution. So uh, Agustin de Iturbide decides, hey, wait a minute, let's stop this fighting. And he goes to the persons that he can't defeat. He, he goes to Guerrero, um, to uh, Vicente Guerrero. He can't defeat him. And so he goes, I'll tell you what, let's have peace. And the peace that we have is that we'll become an independent nation. Drop your arms and let's make some guarantees. But let's make me the emperor. I want to be an emperor. I want to control this fiefdom uh, and we'll give you your guarantees. So the independent Mexican nation is going to be organized as a constitutional monarchy with Agustin de Iturbide being the monarch. The Catholic religion will still be given a monopoly. The clergy will retain all its privileges. But now everyone is to participate equally in the constitutional process. So really the idea becomes in the plan is save the Gachupin. No longer destroy the Gachupin, but let's save the white privileges, but we'll go ahead and begin to give privileges to people of color. In essence, that's what it is. But uh, Vicente Guerrero wants to ensure event that, that, that you must eventually abolish slavery. So he shares with Agustin de Iturbide, Agustin de Iturbide shares with Vicente Guerrero that yes, we will take steps to eventually abolish slavery. So. <laughs> Very conveniently, um, Agustin de Iturbide becomes emperor of Mexico. This is a, a, a convenient plan. Agustin uh, is, is significant in this particular experience because uh, Agustin de Iturbide is significant because he will make sure that Mexico will become independent from Spain, and so he's given that credit and honor. However, he's a monarch, and so as a monarch, he assumes the throne as emperor with all the pomp and ceremony. So with the empire, Mexico as an empire, um, it was huge. It went from Northern California, east to Texas, south to Panama, uh, to the present nation of Panama. Um, Mexico was huge. And what's going to happen is that in this attempt, um, the, uh, he has to put down independence rebellions because the Central American states, they don't agree with Mexico that they're part of Mexico. So the Central American states are going to organize as a rebellion and they want their independence from Mexico. They're not participating in, in the Mexican struggle. They're wanting their own autonomy. So the Central American states of Honduras, El Salvador, Costa Rica organize. Um, Agustin de Iturbide is going to have to appoint Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana as commander of the port city of Veracruz to defend the interests. The boundaries between the empire and the United States were never clearly drawn. Um, President Monroe uh, does not want to deal or negotiate with an emperor, but with a Republican government. The war for independence uh, devastated rich agricultural mining regions in the center. And the average citizen is going to feel the impact of this rebellion. Soldiers and bureaucrats become uneasy. Iturbide reacts. Uh, he suppresses freedom of speech. He arrests critics. And uh, eventually, uh, Agustin de Iturbide will be ousted. Um, let's go to a film clip that will end this segment of Mexican independence. Let's go and appreciate um, the bicentennial uh, celebration of 200 years 
of independence uh, in Mexico that occurred in 2010 um, because the, the September 16th, El Grito de Dolores, uh, was shouted on uh, uh, September 16th, 1810. So 2010, Mexico celebrated 200 years. So let's end this segment with an appreciation for the Mexican independence movement. It all began with a call, with Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla urging on the people of New Spain to fight for their independence. But history unfolds for a reason. Several events in Europe and America lead up to Father Hidalgo's call. The winds of freedom are sweeping through the world. A war of independence is being fought in the United States to free itself of England. And the French Revolution seeks to cast off the tyranny of the king. These wars reaffirm the right of all people to fight for their freedom, for equality, and the right to elect their own governments. In 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte invades Spain and takes Charles IV and King Ferdinand VII as prisoners. This unleashes a war against the French and brings instability to the Spanish colonies. At this time, New Spain is the Spanish Empire's most prosperous territory, but its wealth benefits the Spanish crown more than it benefits the colony itself, which angers those who live there. Several clandestine groups form to begin the independence movement. One of these conspiracies sets off the war. The meetings of Miguel Hidalgo, Ignacio Allende, Juan Aldama, and Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez in Querétaro are discovered. Hidalgo goes to the church in the town of Dolores and calls on the people to overthrow the government of New Spain. With a standard of the Virgin of Guadalupe as their flag, the rebels win their first victories over the troops loyal to the king, which are defeated in the bloody battle at the public granary, the Alondiga de Granaditas in Guanajuato. The rebels are unstoppable on their march to Mexico City, but after the Battle of Monte de las Cruces on the outskirts of the capital, Hidalgo decides to retreat despite his victory there. The independence forces occupy Guadalajara. There, they try to organize a government. They start a newspaper, El Despertador Americano, and they proclaim the abolition of slavery. But royalist forces under the command of Felix Maria Calleja follow in close pursuit. The two armies engage in combat outside of Guadalajara in the Battle of Calderon Bridge, where the rebels suffer their worst defeat. Fleeing north, Hidalgo, Allende, Mariano Jimenez, and Juan Aldama are ambushed and taken prisoners in Acatita de Baján, Guahuila. Later, they are tried and executed in Chihuahua. After the death of Hidalgo, another parish priest takes command, José María Morelos y Pavón. The high point of his military career is breaking the siege of Cuautla, where 7,000 of Calleja's troops had kept Morelos and 3,000 rebels under siege for 72 days. In addition to his military genius, Morelos is a visionary who seeks to provide the new country with a political organization. He assembles the Congress of Anahuac and reads there a document entitled Sentiments of the Nation. In Apatzingan, Congress adopts Mexico's first constitution, which establishes the country's political structure and a division of powers into the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. But soon after, Morelos begins to lose his battles. In 1815, he is taken prisoner, tried, and executed. In 1817, the independence movement was losing momentum when a liberal Spaniard, Javier Mina, gave it new impetus by arriving in Mexico with 300 men to fight with the rebels. After a bold campaign, he is trapped and shot in the back, accused of betraying his homeland. An event in 1820 changes the course of history. Spanish King Ferdinand VII accepts a liberal constitution, which eliminates many of the political, economic, and social privileges enjoyed by the Spaniards living in the colonies. This accelerates the move towards independence in Mexico. Creoles, Spaniards, Mestizos, the indigenous population, and other elements of society all fight for the same goal, although for different reasons. The War of Independence ends when Vicente Guerrero, the most well-known rebel, and Agustin de Iturbide, a Creole at the head of the Royalist Army, seal a pact with the embrace of Acatempa. 
With the plan of Iguala, or the plan of the three guarantees, Iturbide proclaims the independence of Mexico. After 11 years of fighting and three centuries of domination by Spain, Mexico emerges as an independent nation.